Good morning, and welcome to Decoding the Executive Order. I'm Brian Chen, the Policy Director of Data and Society, and I will be facilitating today's discussion. In July, the Biden administration announced that it had secured voluntary commitments by leading AI companies to manage risks by, uh, that are posed by AI. And that announcement very quietly kind of snuck all the way at the bottom of that announcement, referenced that the administration was also going to be developing an executive order on AI. That was the first public reference to an AI executive order. And since then, a lot of us have been wondering what is it going to look like? What will it contain? How is it going to approach this uh, question of AI governance? And last week, we finally got our answer. Uh, the Biden administration released its AI executive order on Monday. And then two days later, it released a uh, companion memo by the Office of Management and Budget. Taken together, these two things are the clearest indication of how this administration intends to govern and regulate AI. And it is worth kind of celebrating that. It's a, it's a huge moment. Um, many countries are trying to figure this out. Elected officials are debating what is the right way to address AI. And so now this executive order this and this memo are out in the public and they offer um, a pretty strong statement of what this administration believes the answer should be. So we're gonna get into exactly what this executive order calls for. We're gonna go into the 100 plus pages that are in this order. And for that discussion, we have three excellent panelists. Janet Haven is the executive director of Data and Society. She's also a member of the National AI Advisory Committee. Sorel Friedler is a senior policy fellow at Data and Society. She's also a professor of computer science at Haverford College. And formerly she was at the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy or OSTP. And we have Suresh Venkata Subramanian professor of data science and computer science at Brown University. He was also formerly at OSTP and also is a board member at Data and Society. I'll point out that Sorel and Suresh, when they were at OSTP, were co-authors of the administration's blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. That was released last year and in some ways was the precursor to this new executive order. And you may have seen over the last few months that there was a lot of advocacy around what's gonna be in this ex executive order. Should it implement the AI Bill of Rights? That's something we'll definitely wanna to touch on. So before we get started, um, I just wanna kind of let folks know, in our audience know how the program will go. I've asked our panelists to deliver brief remarks with just a few high level takeaways of the executive order and their reading of the executive order. We'll then have a panel discussion and then we will reserve time at the end for audience uh, Q&A. So if during the course of this conversation you have a question, please throw it in the comments and we will do our best to try to ask that. So um, I'd like to just go into our, um, our, our remarks. Um, Janet, would you please uh, get us started? Sure. Um, thank you, Brian. Thanks for that setup. Uh, so, as Brian said, this is this is a really exciting moment um, for for people who are interested and and have been committed to working towards governance uh, and accountability in in artificial intelligence. And I think that there's a lot that's good in the EO and in the OMB memo. And I also think Brian, you touched on this, but I think it's critical to say that. Um, from the perspective of accountability mandates, which is what I'm, I'm going to talk most about, those two documents really need to be read together. They are they are meant to be a pair. Um, so I'm going to kick us off by by talking through four of the big takeaways that I got from reading them. The first is, and and maybe the most exciting thing is that both documents mandate hard accountability. So rather than voluntary standards and company commitments, which is really what we've seen up until now in, in all of the tech policy space, the EO directs agencies to enforce civil rights protections to protect against algorithmic discrimination and other types of harms. Um, companies that are developing next generation AI models called dual use foundation models in the EO um, have to report to the federal government on an ongoing basis that they are meeting certain safety evaluation and reporting procedures. Um, the draft OMB memo points to a minimum bar of safety and rights protections. 
that agencies themselves must comply with in order to use AI. And if they don't meet that bar, then they're not allowed to use the system. So there, there are a lot of steps along the way to, um, to mandate hard accountability that is enforceable. Um, a second takeaway is that the, the EO and the draft OMB memo set the federal government up to be a model for accountable AI. Um, so, so neither um, document can do as much as what it seems like the administration would like to do to regulate private industry, um, but, but they've kind of turned it on themselves as a starting point. So the government's regulation of its own use of AI through these documents is quite significant. Um, in the absence of legislation, the government's using its power to shape the market and to model uh, a path for private industry and potentially for future legislation. Um, particularly, the OMB memo is really, really useful for state and municipal governments to, in terms of providing a roadmap to develop their own accountability and regulatory standards and governance practices. Um, the third big takeaway is that it's clear from this whole process of everything that's happened over the last year and a half that AI governance is iterative. There isn't one sort of moment where everything is going to be set. Um, the EO and the OMB memo build very substantively on earlier Biden administration efforts like the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights that both um, Sorrell and Suresh were um, authors of. Um, that was released in uh, in October of 2022 by OSTP. It also builds on the EO and the OMB memo. Also build on NIST's um, NIST AI risk management framework, which came out earlier this year. This EO directs um, agencies to develop additional guidance on a huge range of issues related to AI governance, and so we'll be seeing that come out over the next year. The OMB memo is out for public comment, and so it could change, is not yet in its absolutely final form. So what we're seeing is that this is, this is an iterative process and there is still more to come. Um, and then the final point to make uh, is that we need Congress to act in order to enshrine these rights and other protections in law. Uh, this EO and the OMB memo has move the, the debate forward very substantially. It's moved forward action substantially, but without, without these protections enshrined in law and without further steps that um, legislation can do that an EO cannot, uh, we do not have a full suite of protections in place. Thank you, Janet. Um, you mentioned the AI Bill of Rights. Uh, Suresh, you were one of the co-authors. What are your thoughts on the EO? Uh, hi, Brian, and thanks everyone for listening in. Um, the EO is is strong. It has, you know, I would say that when we were, you know, when we were with others working on the blueprint, you know, it, it was in our minds, you know, what would an EO look like that came out of the work we're doing? And I think to see this as a reflection of that is 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 strong. And so maybe maybe I'll start by backing up a little bit and say, you know, what does what was in the in the Bill of Rights uh, and what and why we had those things in there and how that sort of filtered into um, into the EO. So the 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 blueprint for the AI Bill of Rights, for those of you who haven't read it, is you know it has five key principles and they're very sort of easy to understand. They basically say the following that when we build systems that affect people in any significant way, in any material way, whether it's our, our civil rights and civil liberties, our opportunities for advancement or you know, access to vital services that are provided by the government or other entities, the following should be true. These systems should be safe, they shouldn't hurt us, and they should be effective. They should actually work, which is surprisingly few systems that are out there right now you can say that about. So it's a very base level of, 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 of requirements, but it's something that's important to say. These systems should not discriminate. And that, needless to say, it would be a terrible thing. And it has been a terrible thing as these systems you put out that they discriminate against people because of the use of data and the use of the way the algorithm are designed. They should use our data conservatively and carefully and not just willy-nilly collect data, create a surveillance state where we're just collecting tons of data from people and selling it to others and create an economy around it. We should be aware these systems are being used because if you're not aware of systems in use, you can't really do anything about it. You can't inspect it. You can't look at whether it's working correctly or any of the things we want. 
and they should be explainable in the sense that we should understand how they work. If we're, if I'm being subject to a decision, if I don't get a loan, I, I should have the right to know why. Why? What was it about my information that dis- made the system decide I shouldn't get a loan? And then finally, and this is not as much talked about in the broader sphere, but it's critically important, that there should be some human oversight, accountability, and consideration. The idea being that you know, if you go to the airport and there's a facial recognition system and it scans your face and says, oh, we can't match your face, you should still be able to get on the plane. And you shouldn't have to wait half an hour for some, them to bring in someone and miss your flight in the process. We need the equivalent of a dial zero for an operator. There's always should be someone you can talk to who represents accountability, whom you can say, why is the system not working? And that's an important thing. So that's these five principles, um, a, a secret fact, not so secret anymore is that we originally had many, many more, but they kind of distilled down into these core five principles. And the whole point of articulating them was to say, let us think about this from the point of view of what protections people need and not from the point of view of the technology itself, because technology can change, it can evolve, but the protections we need need to be more lasting and more durable. And so I have to say, all of these are in the EO and the OMB memo, as you, as Janet said, we need to read them together. And they're there very strongly. This strong idea that you cannot put systems out without testing them. And you should do that assessment. And then maybe sometimes you should decide not to put them out. That is a, frankly, a worldview shift in technology, <laughs> rather than just putting stuff out there and just seeing what happens. So that's a huge thing. The idea that systems should protect our civil rights and should not discriminate. The idea that they should use our data conservatively, that they should be, that we should have notice, um, and that we, there should be human consideration. All of these elements are in the EO and in the OMB guidance. There's a little less on explainability, but that's maybe for the discussion period we can talk about that. But overall, I think it's very strong. And you know, finally, I do want to point out that there's been a lot of debate and discussion about you know how you know we can't do all this responsible AI work because it'll slow down innovation. I think the EO makes it very clear that there is innovation to be had in doing this equity work. Sorel and I are you know we're computer scientists. We have been innovating for more than a decade, coming up with the ideas that you know in some shape or form we hope will be in the implementation guidance that goes through these things. There's a lot of innovation to be had in making sure our systems are safe and responsibly used. And I, I think it's the EO encourages that innovation, which is great. That's great, thank you. And Sorel, uh, the other the other co-author of the, the AI Bill of Rights, what are your thoughts on the EO and the OMB memo? Hey everyone. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I wanna highlight, you know, I agree with everything that Jana and Suresh have, have said, but one of the things that I think has been lost in some of the coverage of the executive order is the mandate that um, the federal government now needs to abide by OMB guidance when using AI systems, right? At this point, the OMB guidance has been released in draft form, um, but obviously there will be a final form and that'll be binding for federal agencies. Right. And so, you know, as Jenna was saying earlier, that's a form of hard accountability. Um, There's going to be specific actions that agencies have to take. And so I think that that is a real win, both for um, people in terms of being protected by the AI use by their government, but also a longer term win in terms of guiding the actions of private industry. Uh, And so I wanted to take a few moments just to say a little bit more about what is in the draft OMB guidance. Um, So it's focused on protecting the public from harms caused by safety and rights impacting AI. Um, This is just as Suresh was just talking about in terms of scoping the AI Bill of Rights, right? Thinking about impact and not the specific technical mechanisms, which we know can change as AI becomes more advanced. And so the guidance does a great job of really rooting its protections um, in the potential harms to people. And so it does that in in two ways. The first is thinking about safety impacting AI. Um, This is things like transportation, critical infrastructure. Um, And then the other category is rights impacting AI, right? These are things like AI systems used for hiring, um, for healthcare, for criminal justice, and so on. And not only does it frame the document and the protections in that way, it gives specific definitions, right? So that provides a useful accountability structure that others will be able to build on. So it provides a definition for safety impacting AI and for rights impacting AI, and then also includes specific systems that should be presumptively understood 
as safety or rights impacting. And these specific systems are um, built on a long line of research, right, both by researchers in academia, by civil society, and also by journalists, demonstrating various harms of these systems, right? And most of the news articles that you've seen, right, about discrimination or about other harms of AI, you know, these have really clearly informed this memo and made sure that many of those systems are presumptively understood as requiring extra protections. Um, once a system is determined to be rights or safety impacting, then the OMB memo gives a specific set of minimum practices that are going to be required to be instituted by federal agencies, right? Providing a minimum bar of protection for people. And those also build on research over, as Suresh said, you know, more than the past decade about how to institute socio-technical accountability mechanisms for AI systems. Um, so a lot of these are common sense, right, or should be, uh, testing the AI system to make sure that it actually works in its real world context, um, testing it for bias, making sure it's non-discriminatory. Um, importantly, the guidance also calls out at multiple points that if one of these systems fails this test, right, so if it's shown to be discriminatory, then it shouldn't be used. Um, and seeing that type of, again, hard accountability is a really important step from the government. Um, and so, you know, I think as we look forward from this, of course, this is still just draft guidance. So it's entering a public comment period. Um, but it'll also be interesting to see how the definitions and the minimum practices potentially filter out to state and local governments um, looking to govern their own AI use or, AI use or govern um, private company use. Thanks. Thank you all. And, and, and one thing I'm, I'm hearing across all of your, your comments is that you're, you're all generally seeing the executive order and, and the OMB memo as a win. Um, and, and advancing really key insights into AI governance. I want to dig into where you might think the executive order falls short though, right? Um, Sorrel, why don't we start with you? What would you have liked to have seen in this? Yeah, so while the OMB memo does a great job of providing minimum practices, it doesn't really set any red lines for the federal government use of AI, right? So they could have included, for example, a ban on affective computing by law enforcement. Um, so by affective computing, I mean, for example, systems that purport to be able to take a picture or a video of somebody's face and determine how they're feeling, right? Um, is this person angry? Um, and those have received a lot of critical attention from academia that have regularly shown these systems not to work. Um, and what's more, it's anticipated that they could never work, right? People express their emotions in all sorts of ways. It's not consistent. Um, you know, we can't always tell just as people um, what emotion somebody is having. And so there's a real reason to believe that such systems would never work. And what's more, even if they did work, um, I think that that presents a real risk to democracy and freedom of speech um, if you can have some sort of law enforcement oversight of your emotions. That seems deeply concerning to me and I think, you know, presented a, a real opportunity for the federal government to take action and, and prevent this type of potential harm. Um, so I was somewhat disappointed that they didn't. Yeah, I mean... Just to add to that, I, I agree with all of that. I mean, well, uh, I have a slight, uh, slight, tiny, tiny bit of disagreement. You're going to find that we all agree with each other for the most part. But I'll, but first, I want to say I think the, the OMB memo does a good job of this. But again, I think going back to Janet's point, we should read them together. The EO itself, I felt when it first came out, was a little weak on statements about you know law enforcement practices and policing practices. The reason this is important is because some of the you know most egregious, I think, civil rights violations have happened in the realm of using algorithms in the criminal justice setting broadly, whether it's in policing, predictive policing, facial recognition, criminal risk assessments at various stages of the process and so on. And I, I felt like the EO itself was a little weak. I think the OMB memo has done a good job of trying to strengthen that a little bit, but I think there's much more that needs to be done there, especially since a lot of this is not, it's tricky because a lot of this is not the jurisdiction of the federal government directly, but it is indirectly. Similarly to that, I think issues around the border 
and borderline issues around immigration and policing at that space where it starts verging into national security, but not quite, are things where I think the EO is not said enough. But I'm hopeful that, you know, over time we can start figuring out these things. The point where I will, you know, I, I agree completely with Sarel on the on the non-use of effective computing. But my take is rather than having red lines that we have a list of things we ban, we should make sure to strengthen the OMB testing requirements because I'm actually, you know, I feel as a scientist confident that no affective computing system will ever be able to pass the tests that we want these systems to be able to pass in order to be used in any practice as long as you do pre-deployment testing. And so I'm not worried about affective computing sort of slipping in if we didn't ban it and had tests. But then that's why it's so critically important that we have rigorous testing before deployment and actually allow ourselves to say, no, this is not working. We're not going to use it. And that's the only place. And that, I think that at least allows for the possibility, again, as a scientist, of me being wrong about something, that maybe something happens in the future that changes my mind about a particular tech that allows it to be used. I honestly don't think that's going to happen, the effective computing, which is why I'm, I, you know, but I think I'm, I'm leery of the general thing of banning entirely. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just I'll wrap up and bring up two two other points that I would have liked to have seen the EO uh, address more directly. One is the environmental impact of AI. The EO addresses the the potential for AI to be valuable in climate science and mitigation of climate change, and and that is that certainly true. Um, but it says nothing about AI's own environmental impact. And I, I think it, it could have taken the opportunity to draw that out, to draw out the lack of measurement around um, practices for sustainable computing. Um, it missed an opportunity to force reporting, you know, specifically, for instance, on energy and water usage by companies creating some of the biggest AI systems. Um, and so I, I hope that we'll, we'll see attention to the environmental impact of AI through its entire life cycle um, in, in later iterations of, uh, of government governance documents. I guess the second thing that I would um, that I would like to address is that I, that I feel like the EO did not address um, is the is research is the is the field broadly of AI R and D, um, and I think that it could have taken the opportunity to to essentially frame reframe the field of AI R and D as one that is equally concerned with the societal impacts of AI as well as with technological advancement. Um, this was one of the recommendations that was made in the in the NIAC in the National AI uh, National AI Advisory Committee's first uh, year report to think about the AI R and D space as one that is socio technical. Um, I would have loved to have seen a direction to the National Science Foundation, for instance, to develop a, a comprehensive plan to address this directly. And and the reason for that is that we can't really make good decisions about AI development and deployment and governance without continuous attention to understanding what happens when technologies meet people in the real world in real settings. Um, we know that it rarely matches the imagined utopia or dystopia that, you know, that, it, that we hear about. And um, I think that what we've seen with, with the EO and the OMB memo is that both of them draw very meaningfully on exactly that kind of research to, to design this, these, this governance. Um, and we're gonna need more of that because we're not done. And we need to see that kind of work, that kind of sociological, socio-technical work bound very tightly to technological advancement. So I think the, um, the the four of us likely share a kind of uh, a, a conceptual viewpoint of AI and take it kind of broadly, right? We think of these automated decision systems and things like housing or work. Um, but if you ask just like a, a person on the street what they think about AI, chances are they're going to think about generative AI. They're going to think about a chat bot, something that's really dominated the news in the last year. Um, generative AI is addressed in this executive order. 
Um, I'm wondering um, what you make of how it is, um, how the executive order approaches it and how it, it treats its regulation of generative AI. And Suresh, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, I should say first, as a computer scientist, seeing definitions of integer operations and floating point operations in a government document just makes me happy. I just want to say that. <laughs> So once I've once I've said that, let me say I, I'm I thought the EO did a a surprisingly balanced job given the constraints, given the hype and the fear and the doom mongering around generative AI. The EO to some to a degree managed to skirt that by not freaking out, which is good. However, I think the whole section of the EO that looks at generative AI while looking at risks that you know are potentially you know concerning still feels like it's regulating the technology and not the actual use cases in a way that's dangerous because there are things in the eo about well your system is in scope if it uses you know 10 to the 26 integer operations which is frankly a number just pull out of a hat it doesn't mean anything and it will not it will not mean anything as these systems evolve and change, especially as you know designers make sure to design systems that use you know ten to the twenty six minus one operations to be without scope. It's it's a bad idea. And I would say that frankly, the the whole section of the EO talking about generative AI reflects the fact that we really haven't had a lot of time to think about grounded, well thought through policy goals regarding generative AI. And it feels like a first draft of what might eventually be something reasonable, but it does not represent the kind of care and thinking that, you know, the many, many years of work that has gone into the rest of the EO thinking about automated decision systems. So I I think it was helpful to bring it up and to talk about it. I think if they if the White House had not, there would be a lot more questions. But I still think it's a work in progress. I don't think this is actually going to stop anything that anyone wants to do, harmful or otherwise. So I give it kind of a you know a, a, a C or a C minus in terms of quality. <laughs> yeah, and and what I would add to that is that um, the executive order uses the mechanism of the Defense Production Act um, to require testing by companies that create these specifically scoped uh, 10 to the 26th operation systems. Um, and because they use the Defense Production Act, it, it narrows the testing scope that they're looking at, right? They're looking at um, the potential for bioweapons. They're looking at cybersecurity concerns. And those are certainly important concerns. But as we've been discussing, there are, you know, are a whole host of other concerns based on rights impacting AI um, that are pretty much out of scope for this section. And there's going to be associated guidance developed by NIST that will help guide such future testing. And I'm a little bit concerned that because of the way that they've scoped this um, to focus on national security concerns, that those um, rights impacting concerns are going to be left out of the testing guidance right? Which then that testing guidance might be used in other contexts. Um, and now, you know, that might end up meaning that these rights impacting concerns aren't tested for. Um, and those are really critical. I also wanted to, to echo one of Janet's points about environmental reporting. You know, while the generative AI definition that they use is not particularly well substantiated, as Suresh notes about that sort of 10 to the 26th number, um, the one case where that number is really relevant is that systems that use more operations are going to have more energy usage and more water consumption. Um, so I think they really missed the chance to tie, you know, public reporting about those environmental concerns um, to these large systems. Yeah, and I, I guess what I would add on, and I think this is building directly on Sorrell's uh, point about the kind of testing that is that's mandated for uh, for generative AI systems. Um, the, the the EO mandates only one mechanism uh, for testing, which is uh, an approach to a, a methodology called red teaming. Um, and and red teaming is um, is is a is a an approach, a methodology for accountability that is very useful in specific settings. 
and also has limitations specifically for, for the kinds of things that Sorel is pointing to. And I think what, what, I, what I'm sorry that they didn't take the opportunity to do here is to draw on the, the approach that was taken in the OMB memo towards accountability, which is to, um, to specify multiple types of accountability that are used along the life cycle of an AI system to create uh, essentially an ecosystem of approaches. The OMB memo specifies, for instance, impact assessment. So, so testing a, a system um, to see what the impact of that system is on specific populations, particularly historically marginalized or vulnerable populations. Um, the OMB memo also requires a, an assessment of the appropriateness of the data that's used in an AI system. It requires, um, as I think Sarah mentioned earlier, human consideration and fallback. So there needs to be a, a human in the, in the loop to ask questions of when something goes wrong. Um, the OMB memo also requires participatory practices. So feedback from affected groups is collected and then incorporated into um, how that system is used or, or even if it is used. And so by, by approaching the, the uh, accountability around generative AI with a, a single methodology that is um, sort of pre-specified, uh, I think they, they really create limitations around the kinds, of, um, the kinds of outcomes that we're going to see, again, particularly in, in areas like rights and equity. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And, and thinking about those limitations, I mean, it, it, a lot of this is going to come down to the success or failure of all. A lot of this is going to come down to implementation. That's one of the, the things I've seen in a lot of the reporting on this executive order is that it's a lot um, and it's a lot in a short amount of time. How are they going to do this? Um, so I'd love to really just get into the, 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 the nitty gritty details of implementation here. Um, what will what are you looking to? as an indicator of, oh, this is going to be really hard. This is going to, this is going to succeed or fail within the federal government's implementation of this. Um, maybe, Suresh, I could start with you. So one thing that caught my eye was the uh, requirement in the draft guidance that every agency appoint a chief AI officer, a CAIO, um, and that the CAIOs are part of a White House sort of advisory council that will sort of you know observe and sort of you know look at the how the guidance is being implemented. So it's an interesting structure because one of the challenges with AI is that you have both horizontal policy guidance, which means you need guidance that's consistent across different use cases, all the guidance that's in the OMA about impact assessment, about testing, about discrimination mitigation, and so on. But then you also have to allow every agency to customize that guidance to their own needs. So you need that vertical component as well. And so this CIO structure is trying to do both things. The tricky thing, and this is where I don't, I think it's you know an interesting idea, but where the implementation issue becomes important to your question, Brian, is that the idea of a, a CAIO is not, you know, as say widespread as say a CTO or a CIO or a chief privacy officer in, in sort of the industry in the corporate world. Right? It's not as well defined, which means that it is going to be unclear whether, you know, to what extent the job of the chief AI officer is to be an AI booster, an AI innovator, to bring more AI into agencies. To what extent it's supposed to be a sort of a strategic thinker? Think about how AI can improve the processes or can be used uh, in, in the processes of the agency. To what extent the CIO has to be a compliance officer to make sure the AI deployments comply with guidance. And to what extent the AI officer has to be a risk management person to sort of understand the risks involved in deploying AI and make sure those risks are mitigated. So it's a role that's going to have to wear many different hats each of which currently has its own well-defined role. And so figuring out what that new role looks like, who are the right people to hire for that role and what skill set they need to have, right? It's not just a tech skill, but it's not not a tech skill either, is going to be, I think, a challenge for agencies going forward to define that role, especially since they can't just say, oh yeah, we have all these CIOs in industry, we'll just hire someone from there. And even that may not be the right thing to do. So I think that's something I'm going to be looking forward to see exactly how that plays out. 
Yeah, and from my perspective, one of the one of the details I'm really interested to to see play out is what's known as the AI use case inventory. So um, every year, and this is um, already true across the federal government, agencies are required to report out publicly on their AI use cases. Um, and so you can, any of you can see this now um, by going to AI.gov. And those inventories currently essentially include a short description of what the AI use is. And there's been um, detailed reporting that shows that those AI use case inventories are not particularly comprehensive at this point, right? There are uses that are publicly known that are not listed there. Um, and what's more, right now, the amount of information included for each um, AI use is, is pretty minimal, right? So the OMB memo spells out that there's going to be information added to the, to the AI use case inventories about what sorts of risk management procedures are followed. Um, and so that is a real opportunity for the public to actually have a window into what the government is doing and you know whether these steps are even being taken. And so I'm really interested to see you know what sorts of details are added, right? Um, you know, to what extent are we really going to be given a window into how these systems are tested, um, whether they're shown to be effective, right? I would love to see reporting out on, for example, what is the performance metric used for this particular system, right? What level of performance did the system achieve based on that? What are the known limitations, right? When the system should not be used. Um, similarly, I'd love to see reporting out on, you know, how was the system tested for potential bias, right? What sorts of um, demographic characteristics was it actually tested against? Um, what was the sample size for those tests, right? How did the system perform for all of those people? Um, I would love to see public reporting of all of that information, along with information about um, what systems were not receiving uh, a window into, because the OMB also, memo also spells out that some of the AI use cases actually won't be part of um, this sort of public reporting mechanism. And so it would be good to know, for example, how many such systems there are, um, whether their use cases are for law enforcement, right? What's really going on behind the scenes? I think any window we can get into that is going to be key. Um, yeah, I, I think that implementation is obviously the huge next challenge here. Um, I want to I want to channel the great Jen Polka, uh, who wrote a uh, a really excellent piece. I think it, I think it came out last week um, about about implementation and about how the EO moves from the paper into reality. Um, and she argues that we need to lean into existing structures. We need to make it easy to build teams within agencies that we need to, instead of creating whole new, whole new agencies, whole new entities that are responsible centrally, um, she argues for a much more distributed model and taking advantage of what we have to be able to move quickly. And I think that's, I think that's really, really um, smart. The other thing that I see is absolutely critical about this is um, is that as as we uh, move into the phase of what is called in the EO the AI talent surge, uh, we need to understand that as hiring for a broad set of skills and capacities. This is not only about getting more technologists and, and with respect for to my my computer scientist panel friends. Um, not only about getting computer scientists into, into government. I think it's always really important to remember that uh, Dr. Alondra Nelson, who led the effort to, to write the AI Bill of Rights um, in OSTP is a prominent sociologist and was the first deputy director for science and society in OSTP. And her orientation, the capacities and skills that she brought to thinking about technology are I think so, so critical at this, at this moment. So while we need technological talent, we also need, um, we need that, that interdisciplinary expertise. 
Um, and I think it's 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 also important to to recognize this moment as not just taking some directions and putting them into practice, um, but it's it's really about recognizing um, that that the role of government is increasingly data centric and AI mediated, and so that there are a whole set of um, a whole set of ways that we need to be thinking about government's role differently and that this hiring surge and who comes in to lead this is going to very very actively shape that reorientation of government to um, to how it how it deals with technology and its day-to-day -day work yeah i just want to add a brief quote out to janet's point about the diversity of expertise and backgrounds needed in this talent search um, I mean, you know, you mentioned Alondra, who's sort of, you know, the smartest, one of the smartest computer scientists I know, while she's a sociologist as well. And, you know, that, and that perspective is really helpful. And even in industry, I've been hearing that, you know, people are hiring groups consisting of mixed dis interdisciplinary researchers uh, and experts to, to bring to bear on product design. I mean, I know, for example, that's at some of the large big five consulting management consulting companies, some of the people leading their AI consulting efforts have degrees in philosophy and sociology. This is precisely because we need that interdisciplinary approach. As a computer scientist, I have no shame in saying that, that we I need you know guidance from people who understand society and people to make sure that we do a better job. The, the socio-technical aspect of this that Janet was referring to. So we have some excellent questions in the comments. So we're gonna to shift to the, the Q&A portion of today's event. Uh, I'll start with a, a, no favoritism here. I'm gonna start with a, a, a comment from former Data, uh, Data and Society um, uh, uh, Program Director, Amanda Lenhart, who asks, do we think the power of the government purse will be enough to shift shift business practices to improve AI safety and equity? So I guess I can I can jump in quickly <laughs> to begin. Um, I think legislation is also gonna be needed, right? Um, the OMB memo gives, I think, really strong guidance for minimum practices for federal government use of AI. I see no reason why the private sector should be held to a different standard. Um, you know, just as we have legislation that allows us to know that car seats are safe, right, or to allow them to be pulled from the market if they're not safe, um, we need that same type of power and legislation requiring minimum safety standards for safety and rights impacting AI. Um, I'll, I'll jump in there and say that I, I agree with that, and I also I also think it's significant that because the OMB memo uh, is requires a, a sort of second stage of laying out procurement practices for the federal government, that has that's going to have a huge shaping power on the market. Um, it will it will be I think a a real lever um, for those companies who are government contractors. And, um, and that is a subset of companies, of private companies, and, and often those are, those are larger uh, companies. And so, so there's, a, there's a balance there, I think, between uh, what, we can, we, what we can expect to see as becoming more of a norm uh, across the industry and, and the fact that perhaps the companies that are doing work more at the edges or smaller companies who aren't in government contracting are, are going to be able to, to essentially carry on. Um, and so to, to Sorrell's point, we actually need legislation. And I will just quickly add that in the criminal justice realm, in the sort of um, child welfare systems, in, um, in things like benefits, the government is the client. It's not one of many clients, it is the client. So for these systems, that is the dominant player. And so their changes will define the industry. Related question to the power of the purse. Uh, Akina Young asks, does OMB guidance apply to things that federal government is giving grants to? Uh, and she uses the example, they, they use the example of uh, funding to local police departments for surveillance technology. What, what does the OMB say about grants? Currently, it says nothing, yeah. but it could say something, 
draft guidance. Yeah, so, so this is right. This is draft guidance. Right now, it scopes to federal government use of AI, right? It also talks about it talks about both federal government developed AI and also procured AI, right? Both of those are very clearly at scope. And then the question is, what about those government grants? Um, absolutely, this is a key question. It is something that OMB has the power to give guidance about. This does not yet do it. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Thank you, Akina. And, and can I just follow up with that and, and reiterate, it's an open comment section, session right now. So this is the time to, when you see things like that, to make those points to the OMB directly. We have a question from Jake Metcalf. Uh, he highlights that the EO really focuses on the size of foundation models. I think he's referring to the kind of 10 to the 26th uh, parameters. Um, he points out there's not a linear relationship between model size and the resulting harms. Are there are alternative ways that uh, they could have structured that criteria, alternative ways that the federal government should have addressed that in a definition? So it's a very good point. And I think most researchers, I will tell you, including myself who looked at this, have been scratching their heads like, why? <laughs> and But the good thing is, this is temporary. The Secretary of Commerce, the, the way the wording is in the EO is that this is the, the parameters till the Secretary of Commerce provides sort of final guidance on this. NIST is going to be running workshops to get more information on the best way to assess the impact of these systems. And I think again, there will be there, sh there are opportunities to give feedback in a formal way to the government about how what that final guidance on what's scoped in should look like. So this, these numbers are bad, but they're temporary. And I think the goal is to have something better. And I just want to say, having you know had to be inside government receiving these comments, people pay attention. They definitely pay attention. They especially pay attention to constructive suggestions, pointers to references, language that is helpful. So don't think that it's going into a void. Everyone is listening and, and reading very carefully what gets put up. Yeah, and, and I would also add that, you know, the, the OMB guidance takes a really different approach, right? Takes an impact-based approach and also still covers generative AI, right? It's clear that generative AI is in scope um, and includes a definition of safety and rights impacting AI, right? So I would point to that as another model that the federal government has already put forward. We have a question from Lindsay Washburn. Lindsay asks, is there a concern that the executive order concentrates power with big tech? Because they'll be the only ones who have the resources to adhere to these kinds of regulations, whereas smaller companies and startups won't be able to. Any concern? So one of the things that I that makes me not as concerned about this is that there is also a whole ecosystem of startups and larger companies that are trying to fill this gap, right? Essentially trying to provide the services of compliance. So providing sort of a, you know, a sandbox that a startup can do their coding in and then sort of press, you know, print on a bunch of documentation that's related to, you know, having these types of checks in place. Um, and so, you know, I think as this guidance and, you know, other laws um, take force, I think there'll be more such companies, right? So it, in a way, I think it actually uh, provides an avenue for startups um, to exist as part of this ecosystem. And I will add that the EO explicitly talks about how to promote competition and sort of sets out some specific guidelines, in, including encouraging the Federal Trade Commission to pursue anti-competitive practices by large companies, which the FTC has already been willing to sort of look at. So I'm hopeful on that front. Um, I have to say that you know a lot of the big tech companies in the last sort of layoff cycle got rid of a lot of their ethics and responsible AI groups, and startups are filling the gap, and that's a good thing. And we'll see how that plays out. Not, it's not a good thing that they laid off folks. It's a good thing that the startups are filling the gap and the big tech companies are going to have to catch up. Another thing that's included in, in the EO, which, you know, I, I think there are, there are pros and cons here, but it's in terms of creating a broader ecosystem, um, I think it's positive, is funding and, and launching the National AI Research Resource, um, which is the, the kind of you know, public AI cloud, I guess, is the, is the, is the shorthand for it. 
Um, and, and I think there's still a lot of open questions about what that will be and who will use it. But the idea there is to broadly to create a, a public option for AI compute power that, um, that can be open you know, beyond the, the private uh, industry world of startups, it, even to you know, academia and uh, community groups and, and other, other places that don't have the resources uh, to participate in the AI ecosystem. We have a question from Moellen Ramos Yetzko. Is the OMB's minimum bar of protections inclusive of the extent to which AI systems govern our lives in material ways? I think what they're asking, you know, uh, uh, this kind of minimum set of practices, how much is that really gonna affect people? Yeah, so the um, the OMB guidance sets out a list of systems that are presumed to be rights impacting or safety Im impacting. And I think that list is quite comprehensive. Um, so I encourage you to read it. I, you know, it's too comprehensive for me to list it all out now. Um, but it includes impacts from hiring to education, to financial systems, to law enforcement, to immigration, um, and a lot of other things besides. So I think that is a good scoping mechanism. Right. We have a question from Jed Miller. As we push for enforceability of accountability measures, how do we push more to make the explainability and socializing of these tools more accountable? Specifically, what can tech and civil society do alongside government? So I spend a lot of time in classrooms now talking to students who have just heard about AI re responsibility for the first time. They may be taking class in computer science or in data science, and they're hearing about this, and I go do a guest lecture. One thing that's been made up my life a lot easier in the last year or two is be able to say, look, it's not just a thing that I'm telling as a professor. The federal government is saying we need to pay more attention to these issues. And now with the executive order and the OMB guidance, I'm able to say things like, they are looking to hire people into government in the next few years. And it's gonna take a while to do this. So by the time you graduate, they'll be ready for you to bring your tech expertise and your, your social conscious into government to sort of do the work that needs to be done. From my point of view, I think that helps to say, this is not just some fringe topic that some people seem to care about at a university or at a, at, in a civil society. This is something that's front and center and is a priority for the entire US government. And it's important. And there's going to be jobs here. There's going to be um, you know, interest here in, in your ideas and how you do this. That I think is part of the socializing of these concepts, that there is a genuine demand for the skills that students build up in thinking about responsible tech. I, I would also answer that uh, by, by pointing to a, uh, what, one, of, one of the accountability methodologies that is, is named in the OMB memo, which is broadly participation. Um, so the OMB memo asks for the, the or, or demands the inclusion uh, of feedback from affected groups. And, and that is great to see. I think there is so much more to do on, um, on increasing participation in AI governance. Another section actually of the EO that is, um, is focused on workers' rights also uh, mandates um, participation of workers in, in developing the guidance. Um, but I think that's in terms of in terms of thinking about what civil society can do and what civil society can do meaningfully together with government um, and with the research community. I think there's there's a huge opportunity to be developing the um, the, the sort of mechanisms and methodologies of meaningful not theater participation of affected communities and the. Um, inclusion of that feedback into the design and then the governance of these systems. Um, so that that feels to me like a huge a huge opening. 
So one last question before we start to close out. This is from Amos. A lot of the discussion today is on the role of the federal government, uh, the EO and the OMB. What is the role of state and local governments in meaningful AI regulation? And how can the government incentivize it? So I, I will, I guess, quickly jump in here to say, you know, one of the things we've seen with privacy legislation is that states have started to act to implement data privacy protections when the federal government and Congress have fallen short. Um, and so we may see a similar thing play out with AI. Um, I think that would be, you know, a reasonable next step for state and local governments to take um, is to implement that type of binding requirements. And I would say states are doing this, you know, they're, they're all the multi-state working groups, individual states have passed bills of their own on AI. I mean, I know it's a cliche to call the states the laboratories of democracy, but I think in this case, it actually helps to have states coming up with their own ideas, trying things out, seeing what works. As Janet said very early on, this is an iterative process. We're going to learn and adapt and modify guidance as we see things play out. And, you know, that this is a good thing for states to experiment with. And the OMB guidance and the EO is a good framework, and then they can customize it for each state's individual needs. Yeah, I mean, just just building on that, I think that the um, the section in the OMB memo that that Sorel referred to that lists out um, systems that are presumed to be rights impacting and safety impacting is just it's the greatest checklist um, for states to take and municipalities to take and look at against what their systems are, where they are using AI, because that is that is the the, the sort of tripwire for um, for you know individuals within state and local governments to um, to start to take action, to start to look at again, particularly the OMB memo and the kind of list of comprehensive. Um, accountability approaches and and figure out what is going to be meaningful and what's going to work in their specific environment. So I think um, I'm I, I don't know this for sure because I didn't write the OMB memo, but I cannot imagine that the authors of the OMB memo did not were not thinking of that transferability to other jurisdictions very specifically because it is it is written in such an applicable way. Well, we've really only scratched the surface. Um, that's what happens when an EO is 100 plus pages. Uh, but I'm afraid we're at time. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists for their insights. Uh, we, we've had a really productive discussion on the US government's approach to AI governance and accountability, to some of the gaps that the executive order leaves, and then things that remain, things like state and local governance. Uh, I, just, I wanna remind our audience that the OMB memo something that our, our panelists have really pointed to, it, that's the thing that contains a lot of the substance as far as the federal government's commitments around AI. That's a live document. The government is accepting comments on it through December 5th. And so if you think that there are ways that that document can be strengthened, uh, people pointed to the fact that it doesn't uh, have any conditions on federal grants currently, you should consider uh, submitting a comment on behalf of yourself or, or your organization. Um, Please follow Data and Society to hear more about upcoming events and reports from us. And thank you very much for tuning in. Have a great day.